Hey, welcome back. My name is Mr. Kelly, and I'm here to do 10 AP Pre-Calc multiple choice questions in under 10 minutes. Can I get it done? I'm going to pull these questions straight from, where's the best place? College Board. That's right. The course and exam description. They give you example questions. That's where these are coming from. Before we go on any further, let's look at your test a little bit. Ooh. How many multiple choice questions are going to be on the AP Pre-Calc test? Well, if you look at this, you're going to get 28 questions. You got 80 minutes, no calculator. And then you got 12 questions. You can use a calculator, and you have to for some of those. It's required. Or you can use Desmos, which will be in Blue Book. Together, that's 120 minutes. That's two hours of your life. You'll be spending doing multiple choice questions, and the total weighting is 62.5% of your test. So more than half. So you definitely want to get a hold of these multiple choice questions. I'm going to try to hit my goal of 10 questions in 10 minutes. Let's get started. For each one of these questions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the screen be uh, you know, blank here so you can pause it and you can do the question if you want to. So let's do this one together now. Uh, we have a polynomial function that's given, and basically they're asking you about the end behavior. That's, that's as easy as this question is if you know what the end behavior is. So to answer this question, we really have to focus here on the leading term here. And the term that's in front has a leading coefficient of negative 4, and it has a degree up here that is odd. So we need to remember our rules for degrees and leading coefficients. Uh, because this has an odd degree, I know the end behavior is opposite. So on the left, it's going up, and on the right, it's going down. Or on the left, it's going down, and on the right, it's going up. This is what happens for odd degree polynomials. If it's even, they go in the same direction, but that's another question. Okay, so what exactly does this one do? Well, because it's negative in front, that leading coefficient, it starts out high and it ends up going low over time. So it's gonna look something like this. On the right, you're gonna have it going up, and on the left, it's gonna be going down. So we just need to choose which pair of end behaviors will match this type of function here. Let me look here. I mean, if we can narrow it down to two, we're doing pretty well. That's why I tell my students. Uh, what does it say? As we go left, the function is going down. That's not this function. So I can immediately cross off this one and this one. And now we just have two choices to look at. You wanna choose the one that's different. Remember the you know, as we go left, it's going up on the left, and as we go to the right, as x goes to the right, the function is going down to negative infinity, number one, b. I don't think I'm gonna make that. Okay, so here's question number two. Um, I've, I've drawn the increasing parts. They wanna know what, you know, where the water is increasing at a decreasing rate. So the red parts here that I've highlighted from zero to six and from 18 to 30, those represent where it is increasing, but now we need to talk about at a decreasing rate. And so we're talking about something being concave down. When it's concave down, that means that the slope is decreasing and it's going down. Okay, well the only part that is from three to six. If you notice the other parts of the increasing, it's, it's increasing faster and faster. The slope is growing. And that's concave up, and this side right here is concave up. So my final answer there, A, three, six, oh. Okay, number three, what we're getting at in number three is we're talking about vertical asymptotes and holes. And in order to figure that out, we have to see where the denominator equals zero. So let's factor all of these different uh, rational functions here. Okay, so after some fancy factoring here, let's take a look and see what happens. Make sure that your factoring is good. A number, our part A here, what do we get? We get the one to cancel the one. And then the other two have to stay. On the next example, we get x minus 2 canceling x minus 2. Uh, nothing cancels for C, and nothing cancels for D. So now we're asking which one we need a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. Okay, so remember that your factor will be x minus 2. So that will happen where? That will happen here. It will happen here and here. So that narrows it down to A, C, and D. But we need a hole at negative or a hole at x equals one. That means that it canceled out. That's only one of our choices. That's choice A. A has the one canceling, right? And then we have uh, the two remaining in the denominator. So that will create a zero there and a vertical asymptote. Boom, that's number three. Okay, so here's question four, and I have already given you the rule here that we can use to, to answer this question. We're really looking at what is an odd function. So an odd function, if you remember, this is how I think about it. I think about it graphically. So I'm gonna do a really, really easy odd function. This one's odd. And if you remember, the rules are that every x, y point, so if I go over x and then you have this value y, if you go the opposite x direction, you have the opposite y direction and that point will match up right there. Now that's kind of what this rule says. Uh, maybe your teacher uses this rule or maybe a different one that's a little bit similar. They're all equivalent to each other. But in this particular question, it says that p of three is negative four and it's a max. I'm going to try to draw that, but it's going to be terrible. 
So we have this point here, and it's a maximum, which means on this side it goes down, and on this side it goes down, but it's got to come back up, right? And there's a little maximum. You can see you got a little doink right there. On the other side, we have the same type of thing where this point would match up with this point right here. Uh, if we have another point here, there would be a minimum of matchup up there, but essentially what's happening here, we have a relative maximum on the other side. If we look at negative three, that would be this point right here that matches up with them. That would be a relative minimum. Ooh, which one of those shows that? So negative three and then it would be positive four. That would be choice. So question five right here, we have two functions and then K is uh, what H divided by G, which means this guy's on top, G is on the bottom. Obviously, we're going to do some factoring. Let me write that out. So after we factor it, we look only at the denominator down here. The top, we don't care about because functions can equal zero. You just can't divide by zero. So after you factor it all out, please make sure you put the right function in the right place. You get X cannot equal zero, X cannot equal six, and X cannot equal negative three. That looks like choice C. All right, question six. This is an easy one. Let's take a look here. We first have to look at the general shape of it. It's an even function. We talked about even and odd before. So that means that we have an even number of x's. Let's count. Can't be this one. Can't be this one because you see there are three x's in each one. That means these are odd. So it can be c or d. The only difference is we're looking about where that squared is. And if you remember that squared is where the function will bounce. We're looking here at it bouncing at what? A positive value. That means the factor must be negative. I'm looking at choice c here. It has to be choice C. Wow, look at number seven here. This one's tricky. This is not like one that I've seen before. So that's kind of why I like it. But they're saying that we have a function here, G, and you apply all these rules to F, right? And they give you a bunch of tables here, table values. So let me rewrite function G. So I tried to use the different colors. And the only tricky part here, remember horizontal dilations are opposite of what you'd think. It's the reciprocal here. So if it's a factor of two, we're gonna use one half. That's the B value right there. But let's see what else we got here. We're just They wanna know G of negative four. Let's plug in negative four. So if it's a horizontal dilation of a factor of two, negative four, half of negative four is negative two. So I look at the chart. This is where we're at right now. That means that the Y value will be five, but there's a three in front of all that. So it's really three times five. That'll give you 15. You add five to it, we get choice D right there. That So for number eight is obviously a log uh, logarithm question, and we're checking your rules. It's basically all they're doing is checking your rules. And so this logarithm has been condensed. They want you to expand it, which basically means you need to write a log for each part, each term here in this argument you need to write a log for. So you're going to have one, two, three different logs. So if you remember, when you multiply on top, if you're in the numerator, then you can add those logs. They should be positive. And if it's in the bottom, then it should be negative. And you can throw that two as an exponent down front as well. I think with all that worked out, that is choice B. I do believe, I do declare. Number nine is a geometric sequence question. And let me tell you how I would attack this. This is one way to attack it, but I like to look at that exponent and just make it a zero. They're asking which one of these could be this sequence right here. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna let n equal two right here. And then two minus two is zero. So anything to zero power is one. That means it should all equal four, does it? Yes, it does. So that one is possible, okay? That one is possible right there. Let me try with this one. If n equals one, again, I'm trying to make that exponent a zero. If n equals one, then this whole part would go away, right? Because it would be two to the zero power and it would equal eight. All right, that one is possible. But look, it says that that's the starting value I'm looking at. But look, this is doubling. This is obviously not doubling. So we don't even have, don't look at this one. This one obviously can't be it. Let's try C. If n were zero, then this part would fall off and we'd be left with an eight. All right, well, that's not true. So this one can't be it. And then for D, if n was one, then you'd get a zero up here. That would fall off and you'd have 16. That can't be it. Oh, that's gotta be choice A then. A it is. And number 10, they're asking you to find the value of f of g of three. F composed with g of three, we've got to find g of three first. So here's our little table of g. We go to three and we figure out what the output is, negative two. Then we need to find f of negative two. So we can plug that in right over here. Plugging in a negative two into f, what do we get? We get three to the negative two power. They're testing you here. You gotta know what that means. That is one over three squared. And then we get plus four. So it's four plus one ninth. So it's four and one ninth, and you go back to uh, Mr. Burks all the way in middle school, and he will tell you that this equals 37 over nine. Done, that should be choice B. There's the first 10. I didn't make my 10 minutes, or did I? You be the judge. Hey, this is Mr. Kelly. Remember, it's nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. See ya.